My name is Dr. Pavla Reznicek. I'm one of the psychologists here at the Patient and Family Support Services. It's a real pleasure for me to be here this morning. Um, I, I uh, have a 15 minutes to distill sort of the whole <laughs> realm of psychological impact of cancer and uh, hopefully offer you a few tips on what you can do to cope with some of the main things that, that I often see. Um, with patients who come to see me. So I'm gonna to try to sort of give you a little bit of uh, some takeaway uh, ideas. Um, I, I think it's an understatement to say that when you or somebody that you know has been diagnosed with cancer, it's one of the hardest things to, to cope with. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about, so, you know, what makes the psychological impact the, uh, as significant as it does for in the individual because the impact really varies from person to person. And so some of the things to keep in mind um, are the things like your personal history. So if you've had a, and, and I'll talk a little bit about each of these, so personal history, social supports, it impacts your emotional function, your cognitive function, meaning how you think, and your behavior. So I'll just talk about each of these. The personal history, things that will impact the psychological um, experience will be your own experiences of trauma, uh, experiences of loss and suffering. Um, that will make what, whatever the cancer diagnosis is either worse or, or you know, more easy to cope with. Uh, other experiences of illness, uh, your, your own or people that you've known. And of course, uh, the current uh, situation in your life, if there's a, been a great deal of stress or distress, um, you know, in any sort of lifestyle areas of finances, your mar marital relationship, uh, the jobs being stressful, interpersonal things, that certainly is going to have a, uh, these are some of the main factors that impact uh, the psychological experience. Uh, social supports. Some of the things that are really most important around social supports is the knowledge that the, you have somebody to talk to, even if you don't. Um, people often, you know, people often when they come to see me, sort of are often very concerned about sort of what's normal. And in terms of social supports, what's normal is how much support you need. Um, some people really need their all their family and friends around them, and and uh, get a great deal of support from that and other people really need to retreat and do it more, more individually and are comforted by knowing that there's one or two close individuals in their lives. So it really varies and that's quite normal. Uh, the impact of emotion. There's a real range of an emotional experience that's normal. Um, in terms of the cancer diagnosis, often um, I would sort of broadly so to describe three different stages, the, the stage of kind of initial diagnosis, the stage of kind of going through treatment, and then the stage of after treatment's completed. Um, in terms of the emotional response to the diagnosis, there's often, it's, it's very emotionally dysregulating and intense. Uh, people sometimes refer to it as shock and disbelief. Um, and this often lasts days, weeks, sometimes the initial couple of months. But for many people, this initial intense experience does subside and it does improve sort of as the treatment uh, unfolds and as you start to sort of get a sense of kind of what can be done. The impact on cognitions, our thoughts and our beliefs. Um, you might find yourself preoccupied with the information find yourself thinking about it every waking moment. Um, you might find yourself sort of reading as much as you can to try to get information uh, for, for what, you know, that may, be, may or may not be helpful, but um, most people do. Um, you might find it really difficult to, to find a perspective to put it in that's helpful. And in terms of the behavior, um, some people withdraw and turn away from others in their lives. Um, you might find yourself throwing yourself into work and activities or other distractions. Uh, and certainly um, coming to appointments and sort of becoming sort of involved in sort of all of the, the new uh, demands of sort of dealing with the illness can really disrupt the day-to-day -day routines in life. So what do we do with respect to coping? How do we understand coping and what can we, what can we do? 
So a few things that I want to just talk a little bit about is uh, resiliency and coping with anxiety. And I think those were some of the questions that came up earlier this morning. Um, so a few sort of tips around sort of coping with the emotions uh, of anxiety, meaning fear. So uh, some of the things that are helpful to do is to name the feelings. Um, You'd be surprised, uh, you know, how, how how hard it is sometimes even just to kind of name it. Uh, you know, I feel angry, I feel sad, I feel frightened. Um, it's helpful to remember that feelings do come and go. They kind of ride a crest, and even intense emotions, uh, you know, can overwhelm you in a moment, but they do pass, and that's really helpful to remember that. Um, some of the things that are helpful is to connect with nature. It uh, it does help for whatever reason. Um, the things to try to limit around emotional coping is try to limit sort of the harsh and rigid self-assessments about your own emotional function. So, um, you know, people come to me and they say, I, I'm, I, I, I'm too sad. I don't want to be so sad. Why am I feeling so sad? Or I don't want to feel frightened. <laughs> Why am I feeling so scared? Uh, well, the reality is that the, the range of emotional experience is normal and um, you have to deal with whatever it is. The last point there, I want to just kind of highlight emotional reasoning. Um, try to be aware of that. You know, sometimes uh, we kind of work backwards that, you know, if I feel scared, it must mean that the worst thing I fear is going to happen. And we call that emotional reasoning and, and it's really important to kind of put that into check that that's not the case. Um, you know, feelings are just feelings. They don't speak about the truth about how things will unfold. In terms of coping with anxiety, what can you do around thinking? People often talk to me about, you know, I've got to think positively. Well, yes and no. So some of the things that you can try to do, um, try to stay in the here and now. Um, try to plan what's immediately ahead and try to limit kind of thinking too far ahead, uh, too far into the distant future. Uh, you can work at decatastrophizing, meaning um, try to sort of be aware of kind of what, what the imagined catastrophes are and try to find ways to kind of pull away from that. Remind yourself of what you can do to cope. Uh, ground yourself in the here and now. Um, Again, in terms of trying to limit, try to, uh, you know, don't indulge in that kind of ruminative, uh, negative thinking. It's not helpful. It's hard to do, hard to limit it, but be aware of it. The more you're aware of it, the more you can kind of do some of the things that are helpful, which is to try to pull away and bring it back to the here and now. In terms of physiologically, what can you do? Uh, Meditation is an incredibly helpful way of just kind of physiologically regulating the arousal level associated with anxiety. Um, diaphragmatic breathing, breathing from your diaphragm rather than breathing from your chest. Uh, when you're in the moment and you're anticipating news or you're you know, in the doctor's office, you're waiting for the doctor to come in, take a few moments to breathe. <laughs> Not from here, but from your diaphragm. And it really does help. Uh, relaxation exercises uh, and, of course, medication uh, if it feels really intense. And uh, the things to try to limit are alcohol consumption, um, particularly if you're having trouble sleeping. Uh, alcohol can help get you to sleep, but it dysregulates sleep, so it's really not a helpful long term solution. Um, and of course, try to limit sort of taking more medication than you've been prescribed so that it doesn't impact. In terms of some of the lifestyle things, and this I think applies more to sort of, you know, what, how can you manage or cope with the long-standing anxiety that comes after you've gone through treatment. Um, one of the things that, again, you can try to do is try to take stock of your life without being too judgmental. Uh, you won't change your, night, your life overnight. If there is something that you've identified that you need to change, begin to take steps towards that. Again, with, with a realistic sort of goal um, awareness. Uh, again, try to limit the harsh judgments about how you have lived your lives. 
people will often tell me about, you know, I've been in this, mar this unhealthy marriage for too long, or I've been in this stressful job too long. Um, you know, try not to sort of blame yourself for your, your perceived role in sort of how things have unfolded, but try to take steps towards making it the way you would like it to be. Um, when you're going through treatment, it, it's helpful to remember not to try, not to make too many impulsive or big decisions in the life at that time. So, you know, as you're entering treatment, probably not the best time to quit the job or to, uh, you know, quit the marriage or to, um, to, to make the big decisions. So to take it a step at a time, take it a day at a time. Really helpful to remember to engage in activities that are meaningful, pleasurable, that can offer structure and containment. That's a, that's a lot. <laughs> um, you know, but I, I think one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that uh, often people will sort of, you know, as, as the cancer diagnosis hits and you're sort of going through whatever sort of unfolds with respect to treatment, people retreat from all the things that they used to do that made them feel good. You know, they, so they stop. Well, they stop everything that's pleasurable and sometimes it's because of pain or because physically you're unable to do some of those things but it's important to try to be adaptive and to find alternatives that can still sort of bring you some relief. You need things that can take you out of the living with cancer 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even if it sort of offers you a brief uh, distraction or a brief sort of time away from that intensity. It's, it's, it's important and, and you need that. Um, you know, exercise, I think, uh, from so many different perspectives is, is a helpful, again, as much as your body is able to, to uh, allow you to do, you know, exercise, regular exercise is almost as effective as antidepressant medication to control mood. Um, I, I can't underscore the, the value of that.